Christian responsibility and marriage and the family. We've looked at introductory matters last time, parent-child relationships in light of Scripture. And thirdly will be biblical roles of husband and wife. Biblical roles of husband and wife. I want you to have that in your notes since I guess most of you take notes. Then you can put in parentheses. We've got three tapes on it. <laughs> we just dealt with it a few weeks ago. So that's what I would deal with. Uh, what I gave you three weeks ago in three messages is what I used to teach in seminary on that subject. So it really comes here. But I wanted it in your outline in the proper order. So three tapes on restoration of biblical roles of husband and wife. Now, fourthly, and this is what we will begin with tonight, is the biblical view of courtship in preparation for marriage. <clears throat> Must be a lot of them. I didn't hear any married people. Then. Must be a lot of them ready for preparation. Well, uh, it's hard to know how to begin a subject like this. Uh, <laughs> Because if we were all 50 and over and married, it'd be easy. We'd just say, listen to a tape. But <laughs> you're going to have to listen. And this includes parents because uh, it means that you have to have a scriptural attitude toward your children as they grow up and begin courtship and marriage. But all of us will have to listen with our hearts and not our heads. I can guarantee you before we start, you will hear what the Bible has to say. You will hear what is contrary to custom and practice in America and in most of the world today, for that matter. All we've said thus far about the problems in the home and marriage and with the children, juvenile delinquency and so forth, one of the major problems is that parents don't have any control or jurisdiction over their children and their parents right here who do not and uh, uh, it's the typical American scene we're talking about so what we're going to be dealing with is going to be something that you'll just have to be willing to uh, change your way of thinking now I can't I can't force you to do that and of course God wouldn't attempt to but you're going to find out that what we say in this area, this whole area of Christian responsibility and marriage in the family is uh, contrary to what the American scene has produced. You'll never understand why the Christian homes are in the state of confusion and disorder that they are, Christian homes I'm talking about, until you understand that most Christians follow the customs of the world in courtship and marriage. Funeral, death, or whatever. Since in America, parents do not have any control over their children for the most part. The children are really running the American scene. Even the advertising is geared toward the teenager. It's a multi-billion dollar market. Then even at the point of parents who are already married, it's going to be something to change in your thinking. Now, there are two practices relating to courtship and marriage that are unique to the American way of life. Now, that's very important, what I just said. There are two practices concerning courtship and marriage that are unique to the American scene. That's dating and going steady. It was invented right here. You see, that's even quieter than divine healing or <laughs> divine healing or uh, believing for finances or whatever. There are two American institutions in courtship, and that is dating and going steady. It's a pure invention right here. And, of course, it's been carried over into other parts of the world, but we're going to be looking at those two things first of all. And you'll see from what we're going to be saying in the next few weeks that uh, you'll see why there's so many divorces, why there's so many broken homes, why 
children are so mixed up and rebellious, why one out of four marriages fail in America, including Christian marriages, and so on. So we look first at the dating game. <laughs> the dating game. Now you see, uh, right away, you're thinking, well, what in the world is wrong with dating or going steady and so forth? Is because, you see, that's all you know if you're under, right. say, 40 years of age, 30 years of age. You expect, when you get a certain age, start dating as many boys or girls as you can. And there, that, there's a purpose for that. And then you start going steady, which is tantamount to being married in America. So the dating game. Now, parents expect and encourage their children to begin dating. Why? First of all, it's confirmation their children are not abnormal. Now, these are sociological facts. Social scientists, you, as I said so many times, you can dig this up yourself. We get it out of experience as well as uh, what social scientists say and know and their concern. It's confirmation your children are not abnormal. They are popular. And thirdly, that they'll be able to marry in the future if they can get dates. Now, that's a great concern, not only to children as they start growing up. Well, will I ever find anyone that would have me? And it's even a greater concern in most families. Is my child normal? Will he or she? And when they start dating, that's a proof they're popular, and so that takes some of the pressure off. And then boys and girls are motivated by the same values. The more dates I have, the more popular I am. It gives me some assurance I'm normal and will eventually, if I want to, get married. Now the dating game, as I say, as well as going steady, is an American institution under the influence of Hollywood. And uh, say this is almost, some of you be like committing suicide if you're in the teenage realm. But if you're a Christian, you should be willing to follow whatever the Bible has to say. In fact, we just expected here that if you're a Christian, you'll follow what the Bible says. And we're talking out of experience. We raised three daughters, and they didn't date every boy in town. We were just old-fashioned enough that a boy came to the house if he wanted to see her. Didn't meet on a street corner somewhere or so on. Now... I'm going to read an article here. I've got uh, some articles that I've been reading out of various literature and so forth by social scientists because sometimes that's easier than to attempt to ramble about some subjects. But here's one from Associated Press article in New York, and the heading is Under 15 Date Ban Urged. What I've done, I've outlined the article, so I'm going to give you some points that you'll want to write down because they affect our subject at hand, the dating game. The title of the article, written by a social scientist, Under 15 Date Ban Urged. Well, when I was growing up, you never heard of anybody dating under 15, but now it starts almost in kindergarten. One of the nations, I'll get to the points later. I just want, this is by way of introduction, and he has some points uh, in his article. One of the nation's top marriage counselors appealed today to American parents to reverse the dangerous and unhealthy trend toward dating in the early teens by outlawing dating by children under 15. Now, he doesn't mean pass a law, he means outlawing of a social custom. Dr. David R. Mace, executive director of the American Association of Marriage Counselors, writes that the development of a libertine generation may well be the deciding factor in our defeat by the young Russian communists. After a visit to Russia, he observed that America seemed to be saying to its youth, have fun, while the Russians say, be disciplined. Mace said that the unique American custom of teenage dating, now did you get that? See, I knew that before I ever got a hold of this article, that it was an American invention. But here's a social scientist. Who is he? He's executive director of the American Association of Marriage Counselors. He says that the unique American custom of teenage dating is probably the reason that the American divorce rate is four times that of any other Western country. They see why it's important to have a biblical scriptural view about uh, uh, courtship and marriage is because the dating game is the reason why there's so many divorces. That's one of the basic causes. 
Now, of course you don't see the connection, but you will. Because that's, that's all you know in America. Uh, when you get to be 10, you start uh, thinking seriously about girls. And at an age like that, uh, you ought to have things on your mind that are at the level of your mental and emotional and physical development. May said that this is the reason why the divorce rate is four times that of any other country. He listed these damaging side effects of dating in the elementary, junior high, and even high school age groups. Now these side effects is what points I'd like for you to get if you're taking notes. First of all, he said these are the side effects of dating in elementary school, junior high, and even high school age groups. He says, first of all, that dating imposes a social tyranny. And this guy is no, I uh, assume no Christian, but I know that uh, he's not writing as a Christian. He's just a social scientist. And yet, it is the sociologists and psychiatrists and all that see the danger in a lot of the American trend, those trends we gave you earlier. Dating imposes a social tyranny. For example, he says, if you don't have a date for the dance, you don't go at all. And this creates anxiety and forces insecure boys and girls into going steady, simply to ensure social opportunities and social acceptance. I mean, after all, if you, know, if you don't uh, have a date, then you are different than your peer group. And uh, so you're under pressure to at least take a girl out and get an ice cream to prove that you're normal. Secondly, he says, dating fosters a subtle form of mutual exploitation. Dating fosters a subtle form of mutual exploitation. He says, a boy tries to exploit the girl sexually in America and the girl exploits the boy financially. <laughs> Which is true. And he says, this does not develop healthy comradeship and can produce predatory males and spoiled females. Social scientists, not some preacher's sermon on Sunday. This is a fact, but it's someone saying it that uh, has a social concern. Thirdly, he says, dating inspires variety and change in the male-female relationship. Now you're getting to why so many divorces. Dating inspires variety and change in the male-female relationship. Think about that while you're writing. You want to know why so many divorces? Well, they've tried the field before they got married and they just keep on trying it after marriage. He says, dating gives young people a taste for variety and change. If a boy runs into difficulty in his relationship with a girl, he just drops her and finds another and vice versa. This carries over into marriage and is the reason for the divorce habit. Oh, it's good to study these things because you begin to see what, why America is the most messed up, mixed up, divorcing nation in the world. And it's by its invention of the dating game and going steady. Fourthly, he says, dating among youngsters who are not wage earners gives them a distorted attitude toward money. They've always got plenty of it. Where do they get it? From parents. Dating among youngsters who are not wage earners gives them a distorted attitude toward money. He says, this is ludicrous and sinfully expensive. Parents supplying youngsters with money for dating expenses gives them a distorted attitude toward money. You see, parents have become victimized and brainwashed in America until now they think nothing of giving five to twenty dollars to a youngster to go out and have a date, and they charge that up as a part of raising children or the cost of maintaining a home. They don't even think in terms of what they're doing to the child, distorting his values and views. A child in his formative years should have, in a Christian home at least, should have the right 
sort of principles not only taught but practiced. Most of these things we've had to learn. I don't know where you'd get them taught. And uh, while we weren't perfect, uh, I guess we were kind of different. Not abnormal, because the normal for a Christian is what the Bible teaches. But I suppose you could say we were different. Again, he says, dating has promoted a high increase in illegitimate pregnancies and venereal disease. Dating has done that. A high increase in illegitimate pregnancies and venereal disease. In fact, it's rampant in America. Both those things. Dating, the dating game is the reason for it. Anyone, he says, who imagines that immature teenagers can be out together in the complete privacy of a mobile bedroom automobile has increased tremendously the illegitimate babies and venereal diseases. He says, anyone who imagines that an immature teenager can be out together in, a, in the complete privacy that automobiles afford in a culture that's saturated with sex and not indulge in sex is just not being realistic. Now, parents, you have a tremendous responsibility not to just conform to the customs of the world with your children. And you young people, you hold on their solutions. We teach faith here about, what, seven or eight times a week anyway. And there are ways to ensure you'll get married and be happy. <laughs> we'll get to all that. May said the results are apparent in the rising rate of pregnancy among teenage girls, hasty teenage marriages, and the rocketing incidence of venereal disease. Now listen to this, in the 10 to 15 year age group. Babies and venereal disease rampant 10 to 15 years of age. When we were growing up, if you heard of somebody that had venereal disease, it was always some seedy-looking character, you know, that was <laughs> at least of age over 20, but 10 and 15 years old going to the doctor for treatment for, you know, what the names are. Isn't that sad? Dating. Well, it couldn't happen otherwise. Unless you're just not at home and just turn it over to any boy that wants to come in or girl. But there's supposed to be a mother at home, in, ho in the home. And so it'd have to be on a date out in a mobile bedroom. These are facts. They know what the car has done. The invention of the automobile is one of the means that the devil has uh, captured the uh, lives of the youth. He says in the sixth place, dating complicates the relationship between parents and children. Dating complicates the relationship between parents and children. He says, American parents, while condoning early dating, are really worried to death about what their teenagers are doing out there. They know, but they're afraid to ask. That's why a lot of the mothers put their girls on pills. Because that's, at least they feel it's safe, even if it's not right. But American parents, while condoning early dating, are really worried to death about what their teenagers are doing. At the same time, teenagers are distracted between the pressures from their own age group, you know, to conform, and the pressures from their parents who try to keep them out of trouble. So the heading was, dating complicates the relationship between parents and children. See, without the dating, you, you, you can believe you have a lot less problems at home. We just had a lot less problems in our house than we would have had if we just conformed to the customs of the world. With all of these negative effects clearly evident, Dr. Mace advised that we have no time to waste but must reverse the trend by establishing an age below which dating is outlawed by universal social custom. Of course, he isn't speaking as a Christian because actually 
it's the unique American custom itself of dating and going steady that has created the problems. He just wants to somehow make it socially unacceptable for young children to be dating because venereal disease and pregnancies and all are happening now in that age group when they're not even old enough to be using their minds and bodies as adults, even in marriage, you know. So uh, actually, though, it's the problem of dating and going steady, which is the habit which has created the problem. So for Christians in America, there should be biblical solutions, and there are. The world didn't come to an end when we didn't just let our girls run the street. You know, we, we made it through all right. Yeah. We're all here, all saved, baptized in the Holy Ghost. I'm not saying, you know, that we just had smooth sailing and all that, but we didn't have the problems that is in most homes, and some of you are having right now with your children. All right, now the second step, going steady. This is the second stage. Someone particularly attractive comes along, you stop the dating game, and you graduate to going steady with only one, another American custom. Of course, that's only one at a time, usually, because <laughs> generally most of them go steady with at least ten before they get married. Now, in America, going steady is almost equated with marriage. Why do we say that? Well, sociologists know that the steady habit in America, the practice of going steady, the same privileges, the same privileges occur as in marriage, bedroom privileges. Steady is generally indulged in sex before marriage. It's equated with marriage, secondly, because the same responsibilities are to be found. They take upon themselves, steadies, the same responsibilities as marriage couples, you know, about mutual concern, about money, joint bank accounts, where you work, what clothes to buy, where you take a vacation. In fact, the whole life is the same as married, except they just don't have a home set up somewhere in America, and in America usually it's the girl that is in the leadership here. Another article I want to quote from, news article Dateline Washington on this one, concerning the going steady and what the results are. Teenageologists, the experts who spend their time studying the habits and mores of teenagers, have just come up with some more frightening information. It appears that the female of the species is taking over more and more as the head of the tribe, and teenageism is fast developing into matriarchy. Well, we've already told you that, getting the man prepared for marriage. <laughs> A recent study by Lester Rand of the Youth Research Institute of New York reveals that the female teenager is slowly getting control of the purse strings of the teenage male. Rand's survey revealed that teenage boys were turning over their allowances and earnings to their steady girls. Now, they wouldn't do that to a date, but you see, steady is like marriage. They're turning over their allowances and earnings to their steadies. Teenage girls seem to, to have convinced their boyfriends they can manage their money better and make it go farther. Rand also discovered that teenage girls were putting their boyfriends on budgets and deciding what they should buy in the way of clothes as well as luxuries. You can get this out of Ralph Nader's book on, uh, it has to do with the changing sexual scene in America, I forget the title, but anyway, you can get this out of his book along with a lot of other information. He said that the teenage girls are putting them on budgets, they decide where he should work, where or if he should go to college, what films to see, TV programs to watch, when to go to bed, and et cetera, and et cetera, and et cetera. Significance, Rand concludes, it's a long article. Rand concludes the American husband of the future gives every indication of becoming completely housebroken. <laughs> Most of the spade work is being done now. Now the article that I shared with you from Look Magazine uh, a couple of weeks ago in connection with the long-run trends in America, that article suggested that the female influence that begins at birth, you know, over the male, where he has a female nurse in the hospital, and then his mother takes over, and then the teachers take over, and females right down the line. Then when he, 
he ought to be getting a little free from female dominance. I don't mean free from out from under the authority of his parents, but where he ought to be thinking as a male, then he surrenders himself to a teenage steady who becomes his mother again that listens to his problems and tells him when to go in and out. So the conclusion of that article was, because of all this and the institution of momism in America, that the male teenager, the male, period, is basically insecure in America, not sure of his masculinity. He wants a mother in the form of a steady, and then later a mother for a wife. As we've told you before, most men in America marry a mother. They want someone to put your rubbers on, it's raining. Don't park the car over there, the birds. <laughs> Want someone to decide what color house to buy? You go in a clothing store? I'll tell you, friends, it takes grace for me to live in this country speaking scripturally. I could exist a lot better in other cultures like Japan or China or uh, Europe because there it's still more along the line of a patriarchal society. That's why I say that. But you go in a clothing store. My wife and I see this all the time. I'm talking about a male clothing store. And if it's a shirt he wants, the salesman will say, what size do you wear? And she answers, he doesn't know, 16 and a half. <laughs> well, what's the length of your sleeve? Well, why ask him? It's 34. And then he'll go pick out a tie, and does this go with that shirt, dear? As if a man can't think for himself in America. And time and time again, generally, he doesn't open his mouth. She picks out the shoes, the suit, the tie, the whole bit, and does all the talking. Now, if you haven't witnessed that, it's because you're a part of the American scene. I see it all the time. That he can't even pick out an undershirt for himself. <laughs> it is pathetic. It's pathetic. So he wants a mother for a wife, is what I'm saying. Someone he can tell his troubles to. Teenagers are, males are insecure. That is a sociological fact. It would be true if I said it, but as I say, it comes out of years of study of these things, plus the fact it's right up to date. You can get any of the latest information you want from the library or off the bookshelf. Now, we said going steady is uh, tantamount to marriage in America, but there's another side to that. It's not to be equated with being engaged or betrothed, although in actual practice about the same things go on in steady relationships. Now, that doesn't mean in every case, you see. But I didn't make up the statistics. The people who date and go steady provide the statistics. Follow me? So that doesn't mean that everyone who dates is uh, into trouble or who is going steady is into trouble, but the point is that they're involved in a institutions peculiar to the American scene that have no place in the Bible. And there are other ways of achieving the same goals is what we're saying. Well, of course, in the end time, uh, we're going to expect to hear and see some things that are done a little differently by overcomers. And uh, if some of you can't handle it, you're, only, you're not telling us anything, but that you're not going to be an overcomer. You're going to be different to overcome. So going steady is not necessarily to be equated with being engaged, is what I'm saying. Because many of those who go steady never marry. So you see, it's not the same as betrothal in the Bible. In fact, that was a good word up until going steady got popular. And engaged is an American term, but many of those who go steady break up, are, and then they'll go steady for maybe years, you know, with others, half a dozen or ten before they get married. So going steady is not the same as betrothal in the Bible, because there, if you were betrothed, and a woman was found to be unfaithful, for example, like Joseph thought Mary was, then uh, it actually took a bill of divorcement because betrothal was the same as being married without the privileges. But uh, you couldn't just say, well, I'm getting tired of seeing your face and <clears throat> think I'll find me another girl. It just isn't that way. It isn't that way in other cultures. It's just that way in America. We, I'll tell you, friends, we are so 
brainwashed and subject in our churches to the customs of the world because the church just follows the world in America that uh, most people just don't know anything but to do what everyone else is doing. And it isn't as strange that teenagers and married couples in the church, you really don't know if they're Christian until you ask them. If the other church members can't tell you're a Christian without asking, then you yourself ought to want to be making some changes. You ought to want to be different. And I know that uh, even that goes against American custom to want to be different. I get amused at all this youth rebellion wanting to be different, prove their old thing, and they all dress alike. Yeah. <laughs> Faded jeans and uh, long hair. What's different about that? And the music, I'll tell you, there is no difference. <laughs> Same beat, and it's just a repetition of three or four words over and over and over, and no sense to it. You can't understand it. And they even sing the commercials that way now. And I say to my wife, I listen to the news as I eat, and I'll say to her, did you understand a word of that commercial? You don't have to understand it. It's just the way we do it now. But anyway... You ought to want to be different as a Christian. Not self-righteous or for the sake of pride, but for the sake of glory to God. So going steady is not the same as being engaged. Well then, why do they go steady? All right, we'll give you some reasons why steady started after dating. First of all, because it is the American custom. It's a mark of personal achievement proves you're normal. If you can get a steady, you're saying, this is mine, this proves there's something I've conquered, whether it's male or female. Of course, they both feel the same way. This proves that I'm able to act as a, to them, a normal human being. I've acquired something that belongs to me. She's mine, or he's mine. Steadies. You can't say that on dates, but uh, it, it's a sense of ownership. So it's the American custom. Secondly, it makes it easier to excuse the heavy necking that goes on. And we mean by that, of course, to the fullest extent many times. It makes it easier to excuse it. Because, listen, you're not very knowledgeable if you don't know that most parents will excuse a certain amount of liberty if they're going steady. Because, you know, they can always rationalize, well, they'll probably get married. I know something's going on there, but... Uh, thank God they're going steady. That's the American attitude. Many, many parents give liberty to their teenagers because they excuse it as going steady, which, you know, they're thinking engaged, marriage. Another reason why the steady habit is because, as the social scientists have shown us, the American male is basically insecure. He needs someone. When he releases himself from mother, it has to be another mother. So that's the reason for the steady habit. From the girl's side, it's invariably, she's thinking this may be the one, this may be the marriage that I'm, as a normal human being, supposed to eventually experience. Now, of course, here we have a lot of mixed up uh, attitudes today in the past 10 years or so where a lot of women don't want to get married. A lot of young girls, they don't even mind having babies and uh, so on. But that is really still a bit uh, off the wall, abnormal. Now, the fruits of the American custom of going steady are several. A large percentage of the brides in America are pregnant when they marry. A large percentage. That's why they got married. Or it might have been another steady later. Secondly, there's a great increase in illegitimate children without marriage, just illegitimate. Thirdly, a great increase in venereal disease. This is all the result of going steady. Fourthly, a great increase in divorce. You see, under that heading from that article that uh, it encourages variety and change, the dating habit, and results in divorce because of that. So the steady habit encourages divorce in this way is because by the time they marry, 
if they've been going steady very long, they're pretty well bored with one another, sexually and so forth. Uh, bored with one another's company, and they start out, you know, disinterested with one another. There's no mystery to marriage. There's nothing to look forward to. And so it's just get married, and oh, that it's the same old grind that we had in the car. And I don't mean that in any wrong way, but just the same old uh, face I'm looking at. And uh, there's nothing new, nothing different. Marriage should hold out for you uh, uh, the forbidden fruit idea. It should have an air of mystery about it. Now, while it may sound a bit old-fashioned, <laughs> nevertheless, the practice of dating and uh, dating as many boys or girls as you can to prove you're really popular, the practice of going steady to have someone to really share with and neck with, while it may sound old-fashioned, it is an American invention under the influence of Hollywood, and most people unless you're my age or thereabouts i'm talking about old enough to know i i, I know of a time when it was different is what i'm saying how many of you know when it was a time when it was different boy look at there six seven eight nine well we had we got what 909 knows that there was a time <laughs> That was different. I wish somebody'd count the people sometime. Uh, I think I wish that. <laughs> Somebody said, oh, there's eight or nine hundred in upstairs and downstairs, and I everywhere I go, I say, we can't seat them, or eight or nine hundred, and I hope nobody ever comes and counts and says, six fifty is all we could count. <laughs> but uh, nine, I think we had nine hens. Now, a lot of you are older than that. <laughs> If I hadn't thought that, I'd have been a little scared to come up with all these facts. I felt I had a lot of amen corners here. <laughs> I'm talking to people that didn't know it was different. <clears throat> no, I'm just being a little facetious there. I would say it anyway if it was to nine-year-olds. But some of you are old enough, you should have raised your hand. <laughs> now, I won't make any statement like, why didn't you know it used to be different? <laughs> But most people today, I want to give you four or five things. Most people today find it hard to believe there was a time when boys played with boys and thought about boys. You know, going out, I want to play with Jimmy. Hey, Jimmy, come out and play. And they didn't start thinking about dating and getting a ring for a girl in kindergarten or taking her a box of candy. Box of candy, $5 box of candy, little, little kids buy a corsage, take them to dances and all of that. Just little kids, they teach them that now, the sexologists. But it's hard to believe there's a time when boys play with boys and girls play with girls. It's hard to believe, secondly, that as, as boys and girls grew older, their fellowship, the fellowship between the sexes, was generally at large gatherings. Church, now, I know I shouldn't get any moans on that from Christians. Church, picnics, games, socials, hayrides, large events, you know. We growing up, oh, it's normal for boys and girls to, you know, boys think about girls and girls think about boys. That's the way God's made us. But uh, we never got serious or started dating as kids. And when we... We had fellowship, it was at things like this, a picnic in the park together, that sort of thing. Why, anyway, you'd be the biggest sissy in town if you even made like you were going to take a girl out before you were an adult or almost one. A third thing is hard for people to believe today that when you visited a girl, it was by permission of the parents and in her home. Now, I've done that back in my growing up days. In the home. Not get out and blow the horn. Come on out. <laughs> Take off for you know where doing who knows what. And you know, that's not speculation or imagination. 
the statistics are there that the automobile is the source of more sin in America probably than any one, any one invention you can think of. Done more damage than the gun will ever do. Fourthly, it's hard for people to conceive there was a time when going steady was unheard of. That if you had serious interest in one another, you became engaged or betrothed, and you asked the parents for permission to marry the girl. It does sound old-fashioned, but that's, that's the way. I believe that's the way God intends it. Now, the results of the American way ought to convince you something ought to give that anything almost would be an improvement. Illegitimate children, venereal disease, marital problems, divorce rate, disharmony, broken homes, juvenile delinquency. Any change would be an improvement. Is there a biblical view of courtship and marriage? We raise the question in conclusion. There certainly is. And a Christian should want to follow the biblical view of courtship and marriage. Are you aware that God is so concerned with the purity of relationship between men and women that he ordained marriage and not trial marriages of trying as many dates as you can until you can find one that might fit the bill? As we'll see later, there's a way to get a good wife or husband. And God himself will personally supply the best husband or wife. You could, you could never find one because like he would give because the Bible says a good wife is a gift of the Lord Amen. and husband. Are you aware that God is so concerned about the purity of relationship between women, men and women that he knew how he made them so he ordained marriage to fulfill the purpose for which he made man? Are you aware that if a woman upon marriage was found not to be a virgin, she was taken out and stoned? Now that's God's law. Deuteronomy 22. We don't stone them today because we're not under law, but that was the law. Deuteronomy 22. Are you aware, thirdly, that the New Testament stresses purity, condemns fornication, and says fornicators will not enter the kingdom? Now, if anybody is out in that car misbehaving, they'll not enter the kingdom of God. That's what God says. Well, we'll take up there next time.